For PC gamers, there are a few things as exciting as new flagship GPU releases because we usually see huge performance gains over the previous gen. As I'm sure you've seen in a lot of the reviews already, the RTX 5080 just isn't eliciting the same type of reaction, and that comes down to two main factors. Number one, it beats the outgoing 4080 and 4080 supercards by a much smaller margin than we anticipated, and number two, it fails to clear the outgoing 4090, and that's not something we're used to seeing. To be completely transparent, Nvidia sent me this card early, but my video was delayed because I just couldn't believe the benchmark numbers I was getting. I thought there had to be something wrong with my test bed or my methodology. This is what the numbers look like in 4K benchmarks. This is using a 9800X3D, and most of the settings were one step down from whatever the maximum presets are because there's generally some effects on the highest detail levels that are really inefficient. We're seeing an average uplift across these 12 games of only 15% at 4K. It gets even worse at 1440p where we see only a 10% improvement. Consider too that my personal 4080 card is not a super. If you have a 4080 super, these performance gains are even smaller. If you've recently hopped on PC gaming, you may not realize that the expectation for performance gains was much higher. This is plainly illustrated when we look at the difference between the 3080 and the 4080 cards. Look how much smaller the blue bars are here versus the purple bars. If you'd rather see that represented as a percentage, we see an average of a 48% uplift from 3080 to 4080, and that looks very similar at 1440p too. So 48% improvement versus 15%, and it's easy to see why people weren't really wowed by this. The obvious takeaway is that if you're coming from a 4080 or 4080 Super, it's probably not worth upgrading to the 5080. If you're still on a 3080, you're going to see some trend level gains. The other issue is that the 5080 doesn't match or beat the 4090. Here we see my 4090 leading the 5080, at least in my 12 game selection, by a 15% average. Granted, the 4090 is still a very expensive card to find used, and the limited amount of 5090s that were available at launch has made this whole situation even tougher, but we're used to seeing the 80 series cards clear the 90 series cards of the previous gen. Paul actually did a really solid breakdown video on what this has looked like over all the previous gens. I'll link that down in the description. You can see that even the 20 series cards, which people weren't really stoked on at the time, still had some impressive gains versus this gen. It's important to remember that all the conversation to this point has centered around raw performance, native rendering. These benchmarks didn't use any of the DLSS upscaling and no frame gen. We know by now that the claims Jensen made at CES with the 5070 offering 4090 level performance were the result of their new multi-frame generation that's in the new DLSS 4 suite. And that seems to be what NVIDIA is really banking on for this generation and presumably going forward. This is introducing a lot of subjective opinions about GPU performance into an area that's normally really objective. Assuming the tests are carried out with any level of competence, it's pretty tough to argue with the numbers from comparative benchmarks. The numbers just are what they are. So DLSS 4 is a suite of features designed to improve the output of games, and there's two that are really important for this conversation. The first is DLSS upscaling, which renders the base game at a lower resolution and then uses AI to upscale to a higher resolution output but that gives you a similar performance to the lower resolution, but it looks much better. For single player stuff, especially at 4K, I run this almost all the time. The quality for me is nearly indistinguishable from the real thing, and it allows me to turn up graphical details for a 4K experience and still enjoy high frame rates. Here we see the difference this can make in just a few titles. If your game supports it, turn it on, and it's basically free frames. There's not a lot of controversy here, and it's available on any RTX series card going back to the 20 series. The feature that's causing such a wide range of reactions is frame gen, where the GPU is inserting a generated frame in between between each native frame, or what some people call real frames. This isn't new, we've had this since the 40 series, but multi-frame gen is new, it's exclusive to the 50 series, and allows you to insert up to three generated frames in between each native frame. So that's like four times as much FPS, right? Well, not exactly. The simplest way I can think to explain this is that real or native frames are responding directly to input from your mouse and keyboard, whereas AI-generated frames aren't because they're occurring in between game engine frames. This is where the idea of fake frames comes from. So using frame gen introduces input latency. This is why I just can't say it loud enough that if you're playing competitive titles, like shooters, rhythm games, even something like Rocket League, even something like a Souls-like single player where the combat timing is really precise, do not use frame gen. But outside of latency, there's another issue at work with multi-frame gen, which Tim over at Hardware Unboxed has done a truly excellent job of breaking down, and that's what happens when the base rate of your game dips below a certain number. Whenever you start talking super high FPS output, whether it's monitors, GPUs, whatever, you have people with a self-awarded doctorate of comment section science telling you the human eye can't see over 60 FPS anyway, which whatever, but what that argument always misses is feel. It's easy to show how a frame looks quality and fidelity wise in a YouTube video. It's harder to show how smooth the experience looks because of camera and YouTube limitations, and it's nearly impossible to show how smooth input feels in a YouTube video. If you've ever played 30 FPS versus 60 FPS, you know the way the visual response to your input feels much smoother at 60. When you're using multi-frame gen on something like Cyberpunk, you may be seeing 200 FPS, but if your base rate dips below 60, your controls might 
feel sluggish compared to what you're seeing on screen. And that's why benchmark numbers of multi-frame gen aren't showing the full picture. In general, you'll have a better time using multi-frame gen when you have a higher base rate number because all it's really doing is giving you more of whatever's already happening on screen. Take this example of Cyberpunk, where we're running at 4K ultra settings, no ray tracing, no upscaling, just a native 4K ultra render. We're pulling between 77 and 85 FPS and everything looks and feels smooth. Now we're gonna throw in just a little ray tracing, nothing crazy. Now we're sitting around 45 to 50 FPS and things feel a little sluggish, that motion blur is becoming a little much. Let's bump up the ray tracing and throw in some path tracing. Now we're sitting right around 20 to 23 FPS and I think you'd agree this is now basically unusable. So logic would say, let's throw on 4X frame gen. That should take our 20 to 23 FPS more like 80 to 90 FPS and things should feel smooth again. Right? We're actually getting around 70 to 75 FPS and it's just a more fluid version of the same poor presentation we had at 20 FPS. Still completely unusable. It's actually multiplying the high motion blur in the graphic settings too, so let's turn that off. Now it's more clear, more smooth, still not what I would consider playable. Aiming feels crazy. The whole thing is nauseating on this 32 inch monitor. What we've essentially done is multiplied poor performance because our base render rate of 20 FPS isn't cutting it. So we can try to improve that base rate by turning on DLSS upscaling. Here it is at quality, motion blur off, we're seeing 130, 150 FPS, and it feels really smooth. Aiming still feels a little floaty and off, but this is usable. As long as that motion blur is off, accidentally leave that on and ouch, because we're multiplying that too. So it becomes more important than ever to know how each individual setting is affecting your game. So this gives you a pretty decent toolbox to play with. And after that, we're just checking for graphical glitches, things caused by using both AI upscaling and AI multi-frame gen. I personally have about 85 hours in Cyberpunk, and I can tell you that I'm way more distracted by things like my model and texture pop in than I am by the errant graphical glitches in DLSS or frame gen. It's not that they're not there, I'm just not nearly as affected by them. And this is where things get really subjective. You may hate the idea of using fake frames in exchange for ray tracing, but it's a major improvement in cyberpunk. This doesn't hold true for all games though. Take Hogfart's Legacy, where it actually adds a weird constantly moving shimmer to some objects. It's easy to think this is an AI byproduct of the frame gen or the upscaling, but it's not. And if you're not going to run ray tracing, then you still get over 90 FPS without using frame gen or upscaling scaling, so it's not even really a conversation. And that's good because using frame gen, I do get some distracting artifacts in certain areas of this game, particularly where someone's hair is backlit. So to me, this is something you should consider if you really want to crank up the eye candy where it otherwise wouldn't be possible. Even if you do have one of the newer 4K 240 hertz monitors, I would not use multi-frame gen to max out that monitor. If I'm getting between 90 and 120 FPS in a single player game in 4K, I'm good. I'll save the overhead in that monitor for games that can take advantage of it without using frame gen. But again, this is highly subjective. Now, if you find yourself on the line of trying to get at least a solid 60 FPS base rate, you could consider overclocking. I don't generally overclock my cards anymore. I get way more enjoyment out of playing my game uninterrupted than I do mitigating crashes and constantly tweaking my PC. But this is the easiest card I have ever seen to overclock. Load up MSI Afterburner, add 1,000 to the memory and 375 to the core clock, and you're done. And this was stable in every game engine benchmark I put it through. Jay got his card stable a little higher than mine and still validated in the Speedway benchmark. The best score I got was 96.87 at 400 core clock and 1,000 to the memory. I could push the core clock to 425 with 500 to the memory, but it resulted in a lower score. At max fan speed, 400 and 1,000 did validate in Speedway, but it caused a lot of crashes in game. Best I could do stable in game was 375 core, 1,000 to the memory. It pulled a 96.68 in Speedway, and you don't have to adjust anything. With those settings, I didn't even have to adjust the fan curve. Even with the core clock of 3250, temps were 64.3, pulling 358.7 watts. Your mileage may vary, of course, and you overclock at your own risk, but that's a dead easy adjustment to gain another like 10% in game performance. Jay also expressed a theory that they might be artificially limiting these core clocks in order to leave room for a TI or a super variant down the road, and I think that holds a lot of water based on the fact that we didn't really have to do anything here to get a pretty significant performance boost. So the 5080, not a super exciting card. I do love the cooler design and the slimmer form factor because I've been enjoying this aesthetic a lot more lately. And I do get that it's essentially on the same process as the previous gen, but gaming consumers don't really care. We just want to see how much faster we can run our games for the money. So again, if you're on a 40 series, I'd probably skip this card. If you're coming from a 30 series or older, you're going to have a good time. There are some other additions that make this card strong for applications outside gaming, but those users are probably looking at a 5090 with those 32 gigs of VRAM. I am too, and unfortunately, like most of you, I was right there on launch day smashing F5, and I still came away with nothing. It's clear that in 
NVIDIA is hanging their hat heavily on DLSS 4 and multi-frame gen for the series. And while naive, optimistic me hopes that's not a sign of things to come, the smart money says that's where we're headed. I'm seeing a lot of anger out there about this as people think this will be a crutch for devs to not optimize their games. Like I said, I see this more as something that allows you to use some seriously demanding effects that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. But it's hard to ignore games like Star Wars Outlaws where ray tracing is just on all the time. You can turn it down, but you can't turn it off. I definitely don't like seeing multi-frame gen used to pull focus away from really mediocre gains in native rendering and the verbiage of calling native rendering brute force rendering like it's some clumsy outdated method is troubling. If anything, it could make for some really interesting competition this year. High-end buyers are always going to be high-end buyers and AMD doesn't really punch at that level, but the vast majority of PC gamers out there buy mid-tier cards. With Nvidia banking so hard on AI features over raw rendering performance, we could see an upset. It'll be interesting to see what the 5070 Ti looks like. All right, audio people, you are up next, I promise. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.